Hi, Mike Holt at MikeHolt.com. I'm going to have a lot of fun tonight. Just want to take a moment, thank God, giving me the opportunities to make a difference in people's lives. And uh, thank you. All right, first thing is, this is a big question. Gas piping bonding requirements. What do you have to do? Oh, my car is not perfect. I hate it when my car is not perfect. There, okay, perfect. Ready for this? Hey, Mike. What are the NEC requirements for bonding of gas piping systems? Oh, this is so easy. You're not going to believe it. All right, let's understand the concept. Let's understand the theory, okay? And that is in 250.4A4 says this, normally non-carrying carrying electrically conductive materials likely to become energized. Now, what does that mean by likely to become energized? According to the NFPA, NEC code style manual, likely to become energized means that there's actually conductors there. An example, if you have a box and you put conductors, electrical conductors, of course, in a box, and you take that box and you mount it on something, then whatever you mounted it on is likely to become energized. So if you have a fence, let's just pick a stupid example, but it's the best I can think of. If you have a fence, well, is the fence likely to become energized? No, it's not. But if for some reason you ran an electrical circuit out there and you decided, I'm going to take this box and I'm going to mount it on, on a post of the fence, well, then guess what? That fence now is likely to become energized. So let's review this. If you don't take any electrical circuitry to something, then that something is not likely to become energized. Okay? Let's go back again. Normally, non carrying carrying electrically conductive materials likely to become energized. What does that mean? That means you ran a circuit to it. So let's take a look here. Well, this transformer is likely to become energized. This panel is likely to become energized. This steel column is likely to become energized. Um, this gas piping is not likely to become energized because I don't see any electricity. So this gas piping is not likely to become energized, not this one. Now, if I had a fireplace, and if in the fireplace I had a switch that I'm turning on, let's say, some fan, or maybe there's some other things in fireplaces today, who knows what it is, maybe there's internet access on a fireplace. Okay, okay, my mouse is moving here, let me see if I can stop it from moving. Um, so if you had a fireplace and you have electric to the fireplace, well then guess what, that gas piping is likely to become energized. If you have a, a, this gas piping, this compressed air connected to some piece of equipment and that's all metal, well, that's likely to become energized. So now we know what's likely to become energized. So this gas piping here is not likely to become energized, so the code doesn't apply to this. But everything else we've seen here is like, oh, um, by the way, this, this duct work later on you'll see is not, metal ducting is not um, required to be bonded. So not, normally non-carrying, carrying electric conductive materials likely to become energized, must be connected, I say bonded, it says, code says connected to an effective ground fault current path, which actually connected is probably even a better word than bonded, but you know what, bonding is not too bad. And it says, in accordance with 250.104, so this is just a general statement telling you what to do. So now the question was about gas piping, and I, and I get this all the time, particularly corrugated stainless steel tubing, CSST, gas piping. Mike, they want me to bond it. What are the code requirements? Ready for this? Now, in this case here, is this gas piping likely to become energized? Well, yeah, because you ran an electrical circuit to it, and you, since you had power to this furnace, now you have conductors in that enclosure, so the non-carrying carrying conductive parts of this metal furnace is likely to become energized. So what do you have to do? Well, I says, well, then you're going to have to bond it in accordance with 250.104. So now what does 250.104 say? It says, listen, the gas metal piping in or attached to a building is considered bonded by the circuit equipment grounding conductor. Hold on, Mike. What are you telling me? Well, here, so you got to realize that EMT is considered an equipment grounding conductor. And depending upon the rating of the flex in this particular case here, uh, more than likely, Brian, what do you think? That probably a, a 15 amp circuit is probably run there, and this is probably not more than right. six feet? Exactly. Right? Well, if that's the case, well then that flex metal conduit is considered part of the effective ground fault current path, which means that this furnace and the gas piping connected to the furnace 
is actually connected to the equipment grounding conductor, which means it's what? It's bonded. In accordance with 250.4A4, says go to 250.104, 250.104B says any metal piping, not talking about water piping, because that's 250.104A, but other metal piping systems in or attached a building is considered bonded by the circuit equipment grounding conductor. No additional bonding is required by the NEC. You're done. That's it. There you go. That's how you handle gas bonding. Brian, did you say something? Yeah, Mike, we have a, a quick comment. Actually, I'm going to go back to your... Um, if you could go back to the one with the water heater, I've got a comment from Michael, and he says... Um, isn't there continuity of the gas piping to the water heater? And shouldn't we just bond both gas and water heater? What? You mean about the water piping here? He's asking spe specifically, he about, I think, about the gas piping, because you said there was no, not, wasn't likely to become energized. So I don't think it was clear that there was no electrical circuit going to the water heater, I believe, is where the confusion's well, at. Well, if, if, we, if we take a look, if we take a look at this gas piping, it's going to a gas. We need to put a note here, Mike Corbett, make this word gas water pipe. I mean, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, well, a gas water piping. So, so therefore, there's, there's no electric. So I'm, I'm missing something here. What, what does somebody want to do? Okay, so since this is a gas water pipe, but watch this. I'm sorry, what am I saying, water pipe? If this is a gas water heater, so it, this pipe is not required to be bonded. Brian, do you agree with that? Yep, 100%. But what about if it was electric? Whole different ball game. Well, if it was electric, it's required to be bonded, but it's automatically bonded because you have to bring in the equipment grounding conductor to the equipment in the first place. So there's nothing to do, no matter how you do it. There's nothing to do. Okay, that's it. That's the answer. But Mike, the inspector, everybody's saying I got to do this. Okay. They have been attempting to get this in a code to change this requirement since 2008. And the, the NEC says, look, this is gas piping systems. This is not within the scope of the NEC. So what they did do, they said, okay, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to put an informational note in 250.104B and we'll just say something. You ready for that? Here's what it says. Hey, the National Fuel Code, NFPA 54, Section 7.13, contains further information about bonding gas piping. Guess what? I don't care what the fuel code is. You know why? That's a mechanical code. I think that's the mechanical. Yeah, I think it's in the mechanical code. Whoever gets licensed and whoever takes a test and they have to bring their NFPA 54, not NFPA 70 to take their test and their license and they do whatever they want to do. They can do whatever they want to do in 250, I'm sorry, and NFPA 54. That has nothing to do with the electrician. Okay, but Mike, you don't understand, man. They give us all kinds of crap and they say we're supposed to do it. You know what? I'll tell you what we're going to do. Let's go to NFPA 54. Let's find out what it says, so at least that you know what it says. Not that you're responsible for it, but if you decide, you know, Mike, it's easier for me. I just want to do it. I'm like, okay, fine. You want to do it, then go to 54. And here's what it says. Now, this is like a, like a little summary of what it says. 7.13.2 says this. Gas piping system shall be bonded to the grounded service conductor, the grounding electroconductor, or the grounding electrode with a six gauge wire copper run not longer than 75 feet. And they say you're supposed to do it in accordance with the NEC. And I'm like, what are you guys talking about in 54? We don't have to do anything with your gas piping system. So don't be telling them to do it in accordance with the NEC because we don't know what you heck you want us to do. So it's kind of like, yeah, whatever. Okay, so six gauge wire, not more than 75 feet long, uh, copper conductor, and then it goes on and says also 7.13.2.1, the bonding connection shall be with a fitting listed for the purpose. In other words, they have to actually make a fitting specifically for the gas pipe bonding, specifically listed for that purpose. And you have to connect that fitting to rigid metal pipe or to the CSS fitting. And that 
connection has to be accessible. Okay, there's the rules. So now let's take a look at this. Here is the CSS. Of course, you can't bond the actual corrugated stainless steel tubing. So you could put a bonding fitting listed specifically for a CSS fitting. Actually listed for that actual fitting. You could put it right on that fitting. Or you could put it for a fitting listed to terminate on the gas pipe, specifically listed for that purpose. Copper conductor, six gauge, not more than 75 feet. Mike, what, what happens more than 75 feet? I don't know what you're supposed to do. That's, the, that's, that's NFPA 54. And it has to be accessible, so I can't do it up in this location here unless I put like a little access hole. Now my son Michael, who's an electrical contractor, calls me, hey dad, we're doing this outside fireplace out here, da da da, and the inspector is saying I have to bond the gas pipe. I'm like, Michael, this is not part of the code. Dad, I know it's not part of the code. Don't, don't get me into the code part, dad. Just tell me what am I supposed to do? I said, okay. I got your answer. Ready? He goes, yeah, Dad, I need it. I got to get going. Dad, can you give me the answer real quick? Don't try to teach me. Just give me the answer. He's an electrical contractor. You got to get it done, right? He's an electrician. I said, what does anybody want you to do? He goes, oh, the guy said for me to go ahead and connect it over there. I'm like, connect it over there then. Just do it. It's not a national code requirement. We are not required to comply with NFPA 54. And if you're going to do something you don't have to do, you do it the way, you want, the way they want you to do it. So, by the way, this only applies to inside buildings or attached to buildings, not gas piping outside that's not going in a building. So this is a great big mess. It is not a code requirement. The problem is if you actually do the bonding of the gas pipe and something goes wrong, they are going to sue you. And if you don't do the bonding and gas piping that you're not supposed to do, they are going to sue you. It's called life. That's the way it goes. I'm done with that. That's my story. Sticking with it. I did a pretty good job, actually. Are right, you ready? We'll go on to the next rule until uh, we see any comments. Hey, Mike. Replacing damaged receptacles. Mike, what are the NEC requirements when we replace a damaged receptacle? I'm like, okay. So we're going to do a whole bunch of reviews here. There are a lot of houses out, and I'm sure commercial buildings still out there, that have two-wire receptacles. Now, what the code says is this. If you're replacing a non-grounding type receptacle, two-wire receptacle, and there is no equipment grounding conductor at the box, it's just old two-wire Romex or knob and tube, well, then you can replace a two-wire receptacle with another two-wire receptacle. That's an option. I'm not quite sure how much, Brian, you did this a lot of this work here, service work. Is it is there ever a reason an electrical contractor would go out and try to find a two-wire receptacle and replace it with a two-wire, or is it practice to put a grounding-type receptacle Years ago, in? we definitely did put two-wire receptacles like for like just because it was easier. Yeah. Um, now, you know, there's times in a kitchen, if it's two-wire receptacles in a kitchen, uh, we would still put the two-wire receptacles back in because you're always worried about them plugging something in that needs an equipment grounding conductor and you don't have one, but the general practice is to replace it with a three-wire. You know, and a lot of these boxes are pretty, pretty narrow. I mean, uh, they're, not, they're very shallow. Okay, so just, but you can. All right, probably the practice is gonna be, you see, you gotta realize, it's, the option is this, you can replace a two-wire receptacle with a three-wire receptacle, you know, the grounding type receptacle, but when you do that, you have to make sure that receptacle is of the GFCI type on the first outlet of the circuit. See, GFCI receptacles are feed through capability. So if you had the first receptacle as a GFCI, then all the downstream receptacles are gonna be GFCI. But watch what happens here. You had no equipment grounding conductor in that box, you replace it with a grounding type receptacle. Well, then they need to be aware, there needs to be like a little note on there and it says this. GFCI protected, so you have to have that label there. No equipment grounding conductor, you have to have that label, so two labels. If you replace a two-wire receptacle with a GFCI receptacle, then you have to make a note that this is a GFCI receptacle, there's no equipment grounding conductor, and that information is either placed on the receptacle itself or it's placed on the cover plate. This is the only time that you have to put labels that say GFCI protection. Now, continuing on this logic here, so the two-wire receptacle can be replaced with a three-wire receptacle, but when you replace it with a three-wire GFCI type 
and there's no equipment grounding conductor, we talked about what to do. You have to put the label GFCI protected, no equipment ground. And we should, have, we should have that on here. The label should be on here, GFCI protected, no equipment ground. So then the downstream receptacle is going to be GFCI protected. Non ground that can be replaced with GFCI if the receptacle is marked GFCI protected, no equipment. So therefore, this downstream is going to have to be marked either on the receptacle or the cover plate. Probably the cover plate would be better. GFCI protected, no equipment ground. Let me go back on this other one here. We're not going to replace the GFCI, the receptacle or cover plate must be marked, no equipment ground. Oh, okay, then this is wrong here. This should be marked, no equipment ground. So GFCI protection should be removed because if it's a GFCI type, it only needs to be marked, no equipment ground. So we'll get that. I knew something wasn't right. So that was wrong. Just have to say, no equipment ground because it's a GFCI receptacle. You already know that. This receptacle here, you don't know that it's GFCI protected. And you don't know that there's no equipment ground, so you put on there GFCI protected, no equipment ground. Or you can take a two-wire receptacle, replace it with a three-wire receptacle, but either on the receptacle or the cover plate, you mark GFCI protected, no equipment ground, my corporate. Let's have a blow up here so people can see this. And either on the, on the receptacle, and that's the option. So probably the practice is most common get the first receptacle of the circuit, put GFCI type, Mark it, no equipment ground. The downstream receptacles will be GFCI protected. You mark it, GFCI protected, no equipment ground. Or you change out the service and you're changing everything out in there and then you put a GFCI breaker at the panel. And then, you, But if you had no equipment ground, then you're gonna have to put on there GFCI protected, no equipment ground, either on the receptacle or the cover plate. Got it? Okay. Now, there's a rule in 406.4D3 and it says on GFCI protected receptacles, where an existing receptacle is replaced in a location where GFCI protection is now required. You see, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, didn't need to have GFCI protection. But then GFCI protection requirements have been added. They're still being added as every code cycle goes along. And so what this is saying is, listen, whenever the code changes, you don't have to bring everything up to the code. But anytime you make a change, you gotta bring it up to the code. So if you're gonna to have to bring it up to the code and it's a GFCI location, like in a bathroom, uh, a garage, these old houses, you're replacing the receptacle, a two-wire receptacle, you're gonna replace it with another receptacle. That receptacle is gonna to have to be GFCI protected, not a GFCI receptacle. So now I said 210.8 because that's the most common rule when it comes to GFCI protection. But there are many other code sections throughout the NEC in chapters five, uh, six, I don't know if there's anything in seven, I'll have to think about that. Uh, somebody can search it out, okay? So if you're replacing a receptacle in a location where the code currently applies and it requires GFCI protection, then that receptacle has to be GFCI protected. It doesn't have to be of the GFCI type. So let's talk about GFCI protection. How could you do it? Well, you could put a uh, GFCI receptacle, right? And then feed through the receptacles. Um, you could put a faceless GFCI, okay? You could put a faceless type GFCI, and, and that would be fine. We cannot use adapters. These are things would not be permitted to provide that kind of protection. Or you can use a GFCI type breaker. So that's how we're going to do it. Now, Short version, how GFCIs operate. This is, you know, you got to know theory, guys. I mean, even simple GFCIs, you got to understand how they operate. Simply the way they operate, and I'm going to give you the shortest version I've ever taught in my life because this is something you should already know because you should have taken theory, and the theory book should be covering GFCIs, AFCIs, circuit breakers, and all those things. Current leads the source. Brian, can you hear me? And then current returns back to the source, and it's measuring the imbalance magnetic field between the current leaving and the current returning. And when there's an imbalance, and it then converts that into an electrical signal into some kind of measurable device, it says that a class A GFCI opens a circuit when the ground fault current is six milliampers or greater or higher, and does not do so when the ground fault is less than four milliampers. So a GFCI operates between five milliampers plus or minus one, just making a statement and how they operate. Now, 210.8, which is the, probably like the mother load, it's, a, it's the general rule. 
about GFC. You have 422.5 and you have rules in 680 and you have rules in 520 for elevators and you have, I mean, I can't even list of all the different rules off the top of my head, too many. 210.8, and this is pretty much a requirement throughout the code. Even sometimes they don't have it in there, but it, it should be, but it will be. GFCI protection must be installed in a readily accessible location. Article 100 defines readily accessible. What that means is this. You should be able to get to this test button or this on this receptacle or this faceless GFCI or this circuit breaker, you should be able to walk to it and get to it and press it and test it monthly. As a matter of fact, a lot of times we're even marked on that thing, test, test this monthly. So what does that mean? Well, that means that you couldn't put a GFCI receptacle uh, under a sink for a dishwasher disposal. Well, because it's not readily accessible, you'd have to get down. See, you, readily accessible means you don't have to climb up, up over something to get to it. You know, you don't have to like, like get a portable ladder or, or, a, or a five gallon bucket. Uh, you're, you're not supposed to crawl under something to get, to get to it. And you're not supposed to move anything out of the way to get to it. You're supposed to be able to just walk right up to it. Let me give you some examples. Disconnecting means have to be readily accessible. GFCIs have to be readily accessible. Uh, circuit breakers themselves have to be readily accessible. Go right up to the disconnect, get to it. Go up to the breaker, go to the test button. So, you know what? Sometimes we have a tendency like, well, you know, my this isn't. Listen, think about a person who lives in a home and they need to test the GFCI. Let's not play games, stick it under the sink, make them so they can't test it, and make it so that if it does trip, they have no clue where it's at. So let's do our job. That's our job, is to take care of people, make them feel safe, valued, respected, and important. That's our job. All right, so now that we know that, that takes care of GFCIs. Anytime a receptacle is replaced in an area that requires GFCI protection, the receptacle has to be GFCI protected. It doesn't have to be of the GFCI type. Okay, Brian, you got a comment? Yeah, Mike, just a quick point of clarification here. If we go to the code, uh, we want to go to 406.4D. One second. Okay, 406.4 D, what? Which is where we D. were at when we were talking about the B. stickers. Yep. D, I mean, yep, like dog. dog, okay. 406.4D. Yep. Um, and we're going to look at two D C D two Okay, C. A non-grounding type receptacle shall be permitted to be replaced with a grounding type receptacle where supplied through a ground fault circuit interrupter. Where grounding type receptacles are supplied through ground fault circuit interrupters, grounding type receptacles or their cover plates shall be marked GFCI protected. Oh, and no equipment and. ground visible after yeah, the end. Okay, so that first, so that first graphic, Michael yeah. was right. And one of the guys pointed that out on the uh, actually on the Facebook stream. Shall not be connected. Let me read this again. A non-grounding type receptacle shall be permitted to be replaced with a grounding type receptacle, where supplied through a ground fault circuit interrupter, meaning any kind. Where grounding, no, this is not talking about where a grounding type, where a non grounding type receptacle can be replaced with a grounding type receptacle were supplied through a ground fault circuit interrupter. That'd be a breaker or a receptacle, either way. No, yeah, but that's not a, no, that's not a GFCI receptacle. It's saying the downstream receptacles have to be marked. No equipment ground, GFCI protection. But if you put a GFCI receptacle, that does not have to be marked GFCI protected. It has to be marked no equipment ground, and that would be B. So what I said, I think we're still correct. <laughs> He's just talking about you, the downstream you receptacles. You said it a couple of times, different ways, and it was confusing. So well, you, let me say, you have let me say it, it clear. Again. It's very clear okay. now. But let me make it real clear. This graphic is wrong. Because I said you need the GFCI protected label, no equipment ground, okay? And then we went over here and I said the downstream receptacles, and I said that consistently, you have to say no equipment ground GFCI protected. 
And then I went back and I'm like, wait a minute now. This graphic is wrong. It only has to say no equipment ground because this is a 2B rule and that's a 2C rule. So I thought, if you listen to it again, I, I clarified that I had made that mistake. All right. AFCI protection. Where existing receptacles are replaced in locations where AFCI protection is required. So if you need, again, 20 years ago, well, I can't say that 20 years ago, in 1999, 20 years ago, we didn't have AFCI protection requirements. Well, today in 2020, we do. And we have a lot more than they've been migrating and adding and adding and adding. So wherever today you require AFCI protection, those replacement receptacles are going to have to be GF, sorry, AFCI protected. Following the same logic, whether it be uh, an AFCI receptacle and downstream protection, or it be uh, an AFCI breaker protecting that circuit with all those receptacles. So very, very, very similar requirements there. AFCI breakers or electronics, pretty cool stuff, I have to tell you that. I think the coolest thing is taking an AFCI receptacle, taking it apart. You can't put it back together. Just saying. Look at it. Look what it looks like. It's pretty sophisticated what's going out there. And AFCIs are not looking for imbalanced current between the current going out and the current coming back. They're, 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 com they're combination AFCI breakers or and they're looking for parallel faults, which is going to be waveforms and signal characteristics. And they're also looking for series, and there's a different form of testing for the series uh, arcing faults. Um, so they're kind of sophisticated. So where you need them today, and if you're replacing a receptacle where they need them, then they need to be protected by an AFCF protection device. Let's move on to tamper-resistant receptacles. When an existing receptacle is replaced in a location where tamper resistance is required, and by the way, guys, you saw these slides, you put it on pause, you go back and you watch it, and I give you a code reference, get your code book. Every single code reference I've ever given you, go back and double check. Just double check and highlight your code book. So now if you go to 406.12, this lists all the areas that you have to have tamper resistant protection. So if in those areas you're replacing a receptacle, then they're going to have to be tamper resistant. Now, this is my grandson. And uh, there is a receptacle, a little cover plate, though, protection. And he has a spoon. I mean, honestly, pretty boring. I'd rather give him like a little screwdriver or a knife. You know what I mean? I wanted, you know, just to, but I knew my daughter was in the house. And I'm supposed to be a supervised type of person, you know, that kind of stuff. Not that I ever trust me. Anyhow, that's another story. Some of my kids don't let me be with their kids because they think I'm not safe. But, so, I just said, Carson, take a look at that receptacle. You know what he did? He genetically went right for that. As a matter of fact, the reason of the tamper resistance receptacle. So, Brian, why don't you show that video on tamper resistance and let's talk about why is the code required tamper resistance in the first place? So if those of you guys are watching this right now and you think there's no audio, there's audio. There's just no sound with the video. We're just a really cool engineering video that was put together by the guys over at Pass and Seymour showing how this works. Okay, so you saw the technology and how it's supposed to work. And but are they a pain in the butt or what? They're really, I, I hate them. But supposed to, so now, what happened was, I can't remember when it brought, brought in the code. And if you take a look at the slide here, you can see that there's more shaded change, which means in the 2020 code, they even added more and more requirements. And we'll talk about that. But when it first came out, I don't know what cycle, what cycle it was. I think it was like 21,000 kids had gone to the hospital in 11 years. And I think I did the division, it came out to be like 1,900 kids a year went to a hospital related to a receptacle, an electrical powered receptacle. And in that study, they found out that 80% of the, of the children that actually went to the hospital were boys. And I was surprised. I thought it'd be 100% boys because women are so much smarter than guys in, in, in everything. And I couldn't figure out that 20%. And the guy said, Mike, there was a boy around. I'm like, eh. So now let's take a look at this. 
So 15 and 20 ampere, 125 and 250 volt non-locking type receptacles in areas specified in one through eight shall be t listed tamper resistant receptacle. Now there is an exception to this that I'm not gonna be showing to you. So basically you cross out the 250 because there's no 250 volt receptacle that is gonna be tamper resistant. So I'm gonna say 125 volt receptacles. So where do you need them at? In dwelling units. Why? Boys are there. Including attached and detached garages. Oh yeah, boys are there. Accessory buildings, dwelling units, and common areas of multifamily. You have a multifamily building. You have a 20-story building, multifamily. All the hallways, there's boys running around there, right? Temper resistant receptacles. Guest rooms like hotels and guest suites and motels, boys. Child care facilities, preschools and education facilities. Preschools education, that means high school, okay? That means colleges. Even colleges have to have all those receptacles. Why? There's a percentage of boys there. Not as many as girls, but there's boys at colleges. Business offices, corridors, waiting rooms, and the like. In, not, not in business offices, corridors, and waiting rooms. It's business offices, corridors, waiting rooms, and the like in clinics, medical and dental offices, and outpatient facilities. So medical facilities, boys. Um, subset of assemblies including places of awaiting transportation, airports, train stations, bus stations. I guess if you're waiting for an Uber, you know what I mean? Wherever that's at, gymnasiums, skating rinks, auditoriums. There's boys in dormitories. So they even want a dormitory. And you know what? There's still old guys in assisted living facilities. So, so you can see Tampa is, you know what? I mean, it's almost like anywhere there's gonna be a boy, which is everywhere. Now, this rule, there's exceptions to it. it, does not apply if it's above five and a half feet. I just got this email from somebody, just sent it to me like two days ago. Mike, take a look at this. And it was, this was not made up. He was, look, look inside the ground. It got a couple of little, these little tacks in the ground. There's one in there, there's one here, there's one over there, there's a couple over here. You know, the little hole was what? That's the hot, right? The big hole. Oh, look at a 20 amp receptacle. That's nuts. This was in a house. Totally crazy. So I said, hey, was it a boy? His answer, no, nope, little girl. Not sure how old, maybe three. Her dad was there. They put up a TV stand together and board on the back had little tacks. You know how there's little tacks in there? I did some other work there and asked him anything else he needed. He said, just this one receptacle. It sparks whenever I plug in a two plung, prong plug into the outlet. So, but guess what? If that had been a tamper resistant receptacle, you know, you're gonna have to get them both pushed in at the same time. Maybe it wouldn't have worked. So that's a good reason why. He said, Mike, from now on, I'm changing all in my house. All right, weather resistant receptacles, they're marked, you know, WR, where existing receptacles are replaced in locations where weather resistance is required, then the replacement receptacles must be weather resistant type. Well, if you have a receptacle in a damp location, a damp location is a location right here. We shouldn't have this, by the way, in part of this, this paragraph, Mike Corbett. Uh, that should be a separate point. A damp location is one where a receptacle is located under roof, open porches, canopies, marquees, and the like, and not subject to beating rain or water runoff. So this is a damp location, and receptacles installed in damp locations must be of the weather resistance type. So that's an example, weather resistance type. So if you replace a receptacle there, it needs to be weather resistant. Non-locking 15, 20 amp receptacles in a wet location must be listed as weather resistant. So here's another example. This is clearly a wet location because that's where breeding rain is gonna to get to it. Now, Mike, what's the difference between a weather resistant receptacle and a regular receptacle? Well, a weather resistant receptacle is expected the sun's gonna hit it. So therefore the, uh, the plastics, I don't have enough knowledge in what you call plastics, whatever it is. It's designed to handle the UV, the ultraviolet rays from the sun. Also, since it's gonna be in a, in a damp or a wet location, there's moisture, there can be, there's gonna be moisture associated in that box in a, and on those receptacles that you would not have in a indoor location. So therefore, the type of metals that's used um, and there's other properties in that receptacle, so they are made differently, weather resistant, and just small modifications in, in, in longevity. Because if you've ever been in and done service work and you've seen these old receptacles, they're all corroded and breaking apart, 
chipping up and what have you. So where tamper resistance is now required, if you replace a receptacle, then it has to be tamper res I mean, it has to be, I'm sorry, weather resistant. Brian? Any comments on that? Uh, no, but we do have one that came in, um, if we go back to GFCI, and one of the guys mm -hmm. said, is a GFCI receptacle on the roof required for air conditioning equipment considered readily accessible? My AHJ in one county says yes, another county says no. Okay, to answer that question, we need to go to the rule that tells you you need a receptacle on the roof. That is 210.63B, I think. 210.63. No, 210.63. 210.63B. Highlighter. Okay. 210.63, it says equipment requiring service. I'm reading the general rule. A 125 volt single phase 15 or 20 amp braided receptacle outlet shall be installed at an accessible location within 25 feet of the equipment as specified in A and B. So we know you have to have a receptacle within 25, the equi within 25 feet of the equipment and it shall at an accessible location. Brian, you see the word accessible? It didn't say really accessible location, it says at an accessible location. But Mike, we're not talking about the receptacle, we're talking about the GFCI. I don't know, give me a chance. So now, let's go to A, which has to do with heating and refrigeration, 21063A. The required receptacle outlet shall be located on the same level as the heating, air conditioning, refrigeration equipment. The receptacle outlet shall not be connected to the load side of the equipment branch circuit disconnecting means. That means that if you have an air conditioner, let's say on a roof, and then you have a disconnect, and you need to have a receptacle there, you can't like go on the load side, shall not be connected on the load side. People are like, well, I'll just connect on the line side. Probably not, the, the language is not the best. Let's just forget about that sentence, okay? <laughs> now let's go to the exception. A receptacle outlet shall not be required at one and two family dwellings for the service evaporated cool. All right, let's go to 210. Fine. That's the rule. That's right. 210.8 would be 8. B3 exception. B. Our buddy Hold Dan on. pointed that one out to us. 8 B3. Okay, here we go. So, so that receptacle is 63. If we go to 210.8 B3 on rooftops, Receptacles on rooftops shall not be required to be readily accessible other than from the rooftop, which makes sense that that rule would be there because 210.8 is the rule that says it has to be readily accessible. So 210, but if you take a look, there's yeah, B3, and I thought there was another reference. Yeah, I mean the exception there, but there's that reference back over to, uh, to 63. That reference, that reference is on E, so highlight E also. 210.8E. GFCI protection shall be provided for receptacles required by 210.63. So 210.63, as well as 210.8E, says you need to have receptacles. E says it has to be GFCI protection. And then B... Three says the receptacle that's on a rooftop doesn't have to be GFCI protected. So we kind of like three different rules there, the exception. We have three different rules that says, well, one, you need to have a receptacle. Uh, that was 210.63 A and B. I mean, 210.63 A, well, A. A. And then E tells that it has to be GFCI protection. And then B3 says it does not have to be GFCI protected. Well, we to make it, it, it has to be GFCI protected, but it doesn't have to be readily accessible other than from the rooftop. That's, that's what you meant to say. If I didn't say that. <laughs> exactly. What you meant to say. I, I heard what you that. meant, not what you said. Yeah. yeah. Whatever I said, just what you just said, right. You need a receptacle. It has to be GFCI protected. 
but it doesn't have to be readily accessible if it's on the roof. Okay? All right. I'm going to do a real quick one here having to do with motors. Motor circuit sizing. Hey, Mike. I'm doing a calculation on motors. What is a calculated form of the size of circuit conductors protects for a 10 horsepower motor rated 230 volts, three phase with a full load current rating of 28 amps? You see that? Right there. Go to the App Store, whether it be Android or whether it be Apple or OS, iOS, iOS. And just search for Mike Holt and you'll automatically see it'll say electrical toolbox. And then I'm going to do it for you. I hit motors. I'm going to pick commercial because 10 horsepower. I'm going to put on there three phase, 240 volts. I'm going to put on there 10 horsepower and I'm going to set enter. And there are the results. Well, let's go this way here. And there's the results. I don't know if you can see that or not. So, and not only that, but if you go down below that, I'm sure you can't see that. But guess what I have below that? All the code rules, all the math, all the calculations. So if I was teaching a class on motors, guess what I would do? All the students need to download the app, put the example inside here, and then I would just simply go, okay guys, let's go to step one. It says right here, 250%, it gives us a code rule, get your code book out, and you can use this to teach a class. And not only that, but if you're in the field, just done. You can check the inspection, or as an inspector, you can check the jobs, you can check the plans, as a plan review, you know, as, a, as, a, as an engineer or designer, you can kind of double check the work and what you're doing. Bada bing, bada boom. So, that's the question. There's the app, and that's how it works out. Brian, you had a question? Well, not a question. The best part of the app, you forgot to mention, it's free. That's the best mm. part. <laughs> so, uh, so good point. You don't have to even pay anything. You can just download it for free. And it's uh, a couple of guys have asked in either of your app stores, Google Play or Apple, uh, either one, just put in Mike Holt. That's really all you have to do, or Mike Holt Electrical Toolbox. It'll come right up and you can download it and it is free. And it's not just motors. There's a huge amount of features that's on that app there. I mean, huge amount. Of, I mean, look, you start there with all the, app, with the big apps and you just keep going on. You can do graphic of the day, question of the day, video of the day. I mean, newsletters. I mean, everything right there. Just boom, done, finished. All right. There you go. Let's see what time we got. 42, 12, 18 minutes. I think I got some time. You ready for this? Flex and Liquitite for bonding purposes. Mike, please explain when Flex and Liquitite can serve as the required circuit equipment grounding conductor. All right. All right. 25118 lists the different types of equipment grounding conductor. And this graphic is kind of like trying to show you a little bit. Number one is you can always have an equipment grounding conductor of the wire type. Your PVC, let's say you might pull one in that, and sometimes you don't have to, but because you can use a neutral. Uh, Romax, of course, it has equipment grounding conductor. M uh, MC cable, uh, traditional type, will have an equipment grounding conductor. The uh, MC all-purpose cable, it has like a, 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 it has like this bonding conductor, so therefore the outer sheath of the bonding conductor is an equipment grounding conductor. Armor cable has an 18 gauge, so that's an equipment grounding conductor. Rigid metal conduit, is an equipment grounding conductor. Intermediate metal conduit is an equipment grounding conductor. EMT is an equipment grounding conductor. Flex is an equipment grounding conductor, but under limited conditions. Liquitite is an equipment grounding conductor under limited conditions. So that's just general conversation. So 251.18, if we actually went to it in the code book, it would, it'll be telling us, okay, what are the different types of equipment grounding conductors? Number one, copper, aluminum, or copper clad aluminum. Fine. Solid, stranded, insulated, covered, or bare in the form of a wire or a bus bar of any shape. So a solid, con a conductor rather. Rigid metal conduit, intermediate metal conduit, 
EMT. Now number five, which is listed flex metal conduit meeting all the following conditions. So we have A, B, C, D, E. That's five conditions when you can use flex. Let's take a look at a graphic here. Flex, where flexibility isn't necessary after the installation. So if you need to have this thing flexible after you finish your installation, then you always have to have an equipment grounding conductor in there. But you can see right here a piece of flex that's just being installed because it's convenient. There is no maximum length of flex, so you can run flex and you can wire a whole building up with flex. That's perfectly fine. But I'm not saying it's an equipment grounding conductor. I'm saying it can be used that way. So number one, flex has to terminate in fittings that are listed. Well, it means you're going to have to make sure that you comply with 300.15 and you use fittings that are specifically listed for that wiring method, which is flex metal conduit. The circuit is no more than a 20 amp circuit. So 20 amp circuit, that's it. Doesn't matter whether it's a one single phase or three phase, two pole or three pole or single, single pole. The raceway is not larger than an inch and a quarter. Okay, so six feet, not more than six inch and a quarter. And no more than six feet combined length. What that means by that is that if this is two feet, well then the maximum length right here of that circuit would be four, I mean, it's six feet total, well, this is two, then that means this section right here would be no more, no more than four feet. Now, where flexibility is required after the installation, then the wire type equipment grounding conductor would be required to be installed. So, if you have fixtures and you're gonna be using flex, of course I'd use MC cable, but if you had fixtures, you're gonna be using flex, I think we can say that flexibility is required after the installation. Well, then guess what? You need to have an equipment grounding conductor of the wire type installed within that wiring method. By the way, if you see any other lines in the text, that means that that was a 2020 code change. Now, how about if we're talking about liquidite, liquidite metal? Well, if it's three, if it's, if it's half inch, but I don't think anybody's using three eighths. If it's half inch, the length can't be more than six feet and the maximum breaker is 20 amps. So six feet, 20 amps. If it's three quarter through inch and a quarter, then it's still six feet limit length. And, but now you can go up to a 60 amp breaker. So a 60 amp breaker, three quarter, you're going to, in one inch, inch and a quarter, you're going to be fine. Why six foot? Listen, there's no mathematical calculation on six foot. They just, that's what it took for everybody to agree on and that's what it is and so we just, that's what it is. So now, there are other conditions or other items that can be suitable as an equipment grounding conductor and I showed some of these on that first graph, graphic. Armor cable, that's where it has the 18 gauge aluminum bonding strip. Right here. Uh, MI cable, which we're not going to talk about. MC cable, there's different types of NC cables, we're going to talk about that. Cable trays as permitted in 392.10 and 392.60. Cable bus framework, which we're not going to talk about that. Other elastic other listed electrically continuous metal raceways and listed auxiliary gutters, which we're not going to buy auxiliary gutters, you don't use those, and surface metal raceway listed for grounding. Okay, so let's look at some graphics. So, armor cable with the 18 gauge, that means the outer sheath, because this 18 gauge is bonding each convolution, that means that this armor is listed as an equipment grounding conductor because of the construction of that wiring method. MC cable, the traditional type, the outer sheath is not listed as an equipment grounding conductor, so therefore you'd have to install an equipment grounding conductor. But if you get the MC cable all-purpose type from Southwire, and I think there's other manufacturers making some similar, where there is a 10-gauge aluminum conductor that bonds each convolution, let's say this is 12-gauge copper, or then the outer sheath is listed in that combination of that 10 gauge and the outer sheath, that means that that outer sheath is listed as an equipment grounding conductor. What do you do with the, of the MC all-purpose cable? Well, you just take that 10 gauge wire, you bend it back 120 degrees and you cut it off. What do you do with the, uh, and by the way, there's, there's, no, there's an anti-shore bushing required for armor cable. There is no anti-shore bushing required for MC cable. So you just pull it back, cut it off, stick it in a connector, but you gotta be careful. MC cable requires a fitting specifically listed for MC cable. Armor cable requires fitting listed for armor cable. 
and they too do not necessarily are the same because there's different needs. One has an anti-short bushing, one does not have an anti-short bushing, but you still have to make sure those conductors are protected. MC cable fittings are designed differently than armor cable fittings because of the fact that MC cable does not need an anti-short bushing. Um, cable trays, we talked about that under conditions. Uh, a wireway. Now, I'm actually struggling with this because 250.118.13 said listed electrically continuous metal raceways, such as wireways. Does it say wireways? Does it say that in the code or did I just make that up? Other No, it just says continuous metal raceways. I got to be honest with you. I don't know what number 13 is. Maybe somebody listening can tell me. Other listed electrically continuous metal raceways. Hold that because I'm showing this as a wireway, but I know this is a UL standard for wireways. But I don't know, Brian, do you think guys are buying wireways that are listed wireways or is some metal shop somewhere making these things up for the supply houses and just getting them it, out there? It supplies? really depends. Um, it really depends on the application. That's... You know, if it's uh, pre-planned and it's a standard size, yeah, sure. They're just ordering it from the supply oh, okay. house. But there have been a lot of scenarios. We did a lot of industrial and heavy commercial where there wasn't anything specifically available that fit our application. And so, yeah, there's a lot of sheet metal shops. Interestingly, though, you can actually just ask them to build you a wireway and list it. Those sheet metal shops, just like a sign shop, they're actually oh. able to list those. Now, you do pay a little extra for that, but they're okay. able to list those right in-house. I tell you what, if anybody's watching this, if you have a camera and you can take it not this way, but that way, get a picture of a UL sticker or something on a wireway. I would love to have that and send that to Mike and MikeHolt.com. Then I would put that sticker on this wireway and then I wouldn't be so confused. All right. And then the last thing is listed metal surface, listed metal raceways. Okay. Okay. I don't, the text is not correct here. This should be metal raceways listed for grounding can serve as equipment grounding. And it should say surface metal raceways listed for grounding. So, you know that, man, those things are junk. Maybe I'm wrong, but I understand. I mean, you have Walker Duck, you have all the stuff that's, you know, probably okay. But I mean, when I was an electrician, I remember doing some remodel, some old houses, and I got this surface metal raceway, and I'm plugging this into this box, and I'm doing this other stuff. I'm thinking, man, I don't know about this whole thing. I didn't feel comfortable. So those are the types of equipment grounding conductors. Okay, Brian, you had a question. Uh, just a comment, Mike, more than anything else, um, and I'm going to see if I can get the other Brian here to, to get this up on my screen, but... Um, I just looked at a whole bunch of MC and AC connectors, just the common ones, because you made a comment, hey, they have different requirements, yeah. and the, which is true. However, it looks like the right. majority of the manufacturers are now actually listing them for MC and AC and MCI, whatever MCI is, uh, and MCIA, all is just kind of the same connectors. I think they're going through the rigors to make sure that that connector is suitable for those different applications across the board. Um, you know, because, hey, maybe you do need the bushing for one, you don't need the bushing for the other one. They're just like, hey, we're just going to cover it all in one connector. Well, I don't know what MCI, MCIA is, but you brought something up. I'm looking at this graphic here, which is armor cable. And let's just say this is 12-2 armor cable. And with the 18-gauge bonding strip, it has a certain diameter, right? Now, if you, go to R, if you go to MC cable, well, three conductors and let's say they're 12 gauge wire, well, then there's a certain diameter. If you go to same three conductor MC all-purpose cable, that actually has a smaller diameter than traditional MC cable. I'm not quite sure I understand why, but it actually has a smaller diameter. So I would be concerned to understand whether those fittings, okay, if it says armor cable, no problem. If it says MC cable, I'm thinking traditional MC cable. But when you start getting into, because my understanding was the MC all-purpose cable 
that they were unique special fittings for that. So research and get us information, and next week we can go ahead and talk more yeah, about it. Yeah, it it's actually, here. they're so, all set screw style connectors, and, and I, I can't get them up, unfortunately, ah, but the way they're designed, it okay. looks like they've got a lot of availability of throw and the way the connector okay. kind of squishes down on the okay. sheet. So I think that addresses that. But you, it's not going to be the type that you push right. into. It's not going to be the type that These you wrap around screw. the outside. These are all set screw. Okay, so now... Okay, so then, so somebody's, hey, listen, I'll just make it universal and I cover them all yep, exactly. and get them tested. Okay. All right, the last thing I want to do is 251.18 has a note. And I think it's kind of cool. And I didn't know what, I thought I'd have a, we probably should have a, a note and then have a note to explain it, my note. 215.118 says this. For... A definition of an effective ground fault current path. See Article 100. What the heck? Why is it note 250.118 telling me that? Unless, let me read the rule on 250.118. Highlight your code book every single time you read it. Uh, 250.118. It says, the equipment grounding conductor run with or enclosed in the circuit conductor shall be one of the following. And then it says, there's an informational note for the definition of an effective ground fault current path, see Article 100. And I don't know if there's anything, any reason why effective ground fault current path. Yeah, there is. Um, in number six, they have that. In number five, they use the word effective ground fault current path. And number seven, and it's really a good idea. What they're saying is this. That equipment grounding conductor, if you read the definition, Article 100, about the equipment grounding conductor, Let's read it right now. I got the time. 100 equipment grounding conductor. What's that under? Grounding equipment. EFG grounding conductor. It says, no, where's my grounding conductor? Grounding conductor protection equipment. A conductive path that is part of an effective ground fault current path. Hmm. That's a change, 2020 code. It connects normally non-current carrying metal parts of the equipment together and to the system grounding conductor or the grounding electrode. So it's part of the effective ground fault current path. And that, by the way, those of you guys ever seen my videos, you see Eric Stromberg, that was Eric Stromberg to clarify that the equipment grounding conductor is part of the effective ground fault current path. And in 251.18 had a note about 251.18 equipment grounding conductors that, hey, go to Article 100 about the effective ground fault current path. And in the 2020 code, they added the word effective ground fault current path in some of the wiring methods. So what the heck is an effective ground fault current path? Right here. Electrons leave the source, travel through an overcurrent device. There is a ground fault. Ground fault current returns on the equipment grounding conductor, the supply side bonding jumper, the system bonding jumper, back to the source. Trip the breaker. That's how it works. Well, the equipment grounding conductor, the supply side bonding jumper, and the system bonding jumper are all connected together to construct what is called the effective ground fault current path. And if we read the effective ground fault current path, which I just happened to turn to it really, really, really quick, the effective ground fault current path is an, an, an intensely constructed, low impedance, electrically conducted path designed and intended to carry current under ground fault conditions, there's a definition of ground fault, from the point of the ground fault on a wiring system to the electrical supply source. Electrons don't go to ground, guys. They go back to the supply source. And that facilitates the operation of the, the overcurrent protection device. So the purpose of the effective ground fault current path is to facilitate the operation of the overcurrent protection device because it is intensely constructed low impedance so that it can carry the fault current from the ground fault back over to the source. So 250.118 is like everything. As a matter of fact, it's almost everything because everything has to be connected to the equipment grounding conductor. And once you connect it to that, you know, it's going to be energized. It's going to be like metal enclosures and raceways connect to the equipment grounding conductor, which is part of the effective ground fault current path, which clears our fault. That's what I got. I think I got done in time. Any comments?
No, uh, nothing. I'm having fun. Guys. Nothing from the uh, guys streaming in, but uh, I got to tell you, you know, you beat up wire mold pretty bad. And for those of us guys that did really? service in condos or high rises, wire mold could be your best friend because you can't cut the wall. I, I mean, you know, I'm just saying. I, just I don't like, like it, it either, but I'm we had saying, to use it. I didn't like the way it plugged into the I box. I agree. I don't think it should be an equipment ground conductor. Well, I think it's okay I, to use. Listen, I, I put a green wire in everything. You know me. I shouldn't be giving my opinion. <laughs> I think we're good. Hi, guys. Listen, next Wednesday, I'm going to be talking about apprentices and what you guys need to do as an apprentice and talking about getting, and getting ready to take your journeyman's exam because that's what you need to do. Is, if you're working an apprentice, your number one goal is to get the skills and knowledge to become a journeyman. And that's what we're covering next Wednesday and the struggles and the dramas and the emotions and how do you take a test and what do you got to do and everything. So I'll see you next Wednesday. Of course, but I am going to be here next Tuesday at 6 o'clock. So we have Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday next week at 6 o'clock. Wednesday is going to be apprentices and Tuesday and Thursday is technical. God bless.